He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Kia ora and welcome to this Mapuna podcast ko Tamamuru Takawengua. And on today's edition is Fran Ebbett. Now, how I came upon this story is uh, I guess how a lot of journalists can. We follow what's in the newspapers and online, etc. But on this occasion, it was just a simple corridor with one of my kaumatua, Graham Neho, in the far north of New Zealand. And this was about 18 months ago. And he said, look, there's this whanaunga of ours who you should interview and have on your program. And even the bare bones of her story attracted me from the outset. Now, Fran uh, is from the far north. She shares the same whakapapa as myself and Graham. She grew up in the Bay of Plenty. And from a very early age, she had an ambition, a desire to fly. She had Top Gun posters and fighter pilot posters up on her bedroom wall. Uh, Was discouraged a little while at school from that career path, but she went straight from high school into the Navy, where she helped to drive ships. And after a seven-year stint, she came out, and that itch still had to be scratched, and she... That led her to train as a pilot, starting at Massey University. There were mishaps along the way, uh, a rather funny little story about going through a fence. But she rose through the ranks, and she became quite possibly, we can't verify this, but possibly the first Māori woman to captain an Air New Zealand passenger jet. So you'll hear about all of that, plus uh, her thoughts on flying, and I found one of them very interesting, and that was a description of an appreciation for sound and motion being very beneficial in terms of flying a plane. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. Whakarongo mai. Fran, tēnākoe. Tēnākoe, tama. Okay, well, well, I think we'll start with your whakapapa. We do share it. It's, a, it's rooted in muri whenua. So tell us about that. Oh, kia ora. I te taha tōku pāpā, uh, no inga rani ōku tūpona, uh, he tangata tiriti ia. Uh, I te taha tōku māma, ko mamaru te waka, ko rangunu te moana, ko oinu te awa, ko maunga tanifa te maunga. Ko Ngāti Kahu te iwi, ko Ngāi Tohianga te hapu, ko Ōtaru te marae, ko Kahu te anue o te rangi uh, te tūpona, ko te parata te tangata. I te taha o tōku a uh, kuia um, no te rāroa rāua uh, te apauri uh, o ku tūpona hoki. Um, ahakoa no muri whenua hau i tipu ake au i uh, te rohe o mā tātua uh, ko te poke um, me tauranga moana. Uh, ko Fran tōku inga, tēnā koe. Ok, now you mentioned of course te poke. Aye. You grew up outside of the Murifina area. Aye. Why was that? Um, so my um, mother was the eldest of 14 children. Um, and 14? Yeah, 14. <laughs> Just <laughs> the, the standard um, size of a Māori whānau um, back in the day. And she um, became a teacher. And her first job was at a um, small school called Te Ranga in Te Puke. And it's um, Te Puke, the school Te Ranga is about, it's down to Matai Road, but it's halfway between Te Puke and Rotorua, if you were to take the back road to Rotorua from Tauranga. Um, and there she met a uh, man called uh, Graham Ebert, my dad, who was a farmer in the area. And um, she caught his eye and um, they got married and I grew up on a farm there, which is um, how we ended up in Te Puke rather than Kaita. Now you... Uh, you were drawn to flying. Yes. Very young. What was it about flight that got you thinking this might be me one day? To be perfectly honest, I couldn't pinpoint a particular event or why I wanted to learn to fly. It was something that I remember from a really young age wanting to do. And um, my mum was incredibly good at encouraging us to pursue anything that we were really keen to get involved with. Um, So she used to have 
I used to have posters and pictures on my wall of um, fighter jets and things like that. Um, my uncle introduced me to Top Gun when I was like 10 <laughs> and I thought that was pretty cool as well. But anything to do with flying I thought was really neat. Um, it's just that we didn't know anybody that was pilots and it seemed like this magical, unachievable role, a bit like wanting to go to the moon. In, in my eyes, I was like, I'd love to be able to learn how to fly, but how could I possibly do, do that? Um, but when I was at high school, my mum bought me a trial flight, but it still, I must admit, just seemed like, yes, that's something potentially that I could learn how to do, but I'd never be able to do it as a career. So I spoke to um, a teacher once about doing it, and she sort of discouraged me away from it. So strangely, I, I joined the Navy, and I never tried to um, join the Air Force with the idea that maybe one day I might be able to be a helicopter pilot there. Was why why the did that teacher regard, discourage you? Why was it regarded as something unattainable? I would say it's pretty common even today when I speak to people. People are really fascinated that you're a pilot if they don't know anybody that are pilots. And it's one of the few jobs that is a bit of a mystery to people. That Most people have no idea how a plane flies. We live in a, literally now, a bulletproof door that's closed so they don't see inside your office. And it's like this job that no one really understands how it works or understands how you get to that job. And it's always been put on a bit of a pinnacle. Um, a pinnacle that I, I appreciate, but I think is perhaps overstated in comparison to the people that could do it or even people that should be encouraged to do it because they've got the right skill set. So I think for that teacher, she didn't know anyone that was a pilot either, but it seems like only special people are pilots and you had to be extremely bright or extremely academic in maths and physics and all those in order to become a pilot, which is a bit of a myth really. And as a result, I, I think she was just like, oh, you have to be good at maths. Funnily enough, my best subject was math. So in my head, I was kind of thinking, well, I am, I'm quite good at maths. Um, but she actually wasn't a maths teacher. And so she said, oh, maybe you could do air traffic control. Now, air traffic control happens to be very academic. That's actually incredibly hard to do. So encouraging you to do air traffic control instead of a pilot is perhaps... I don't know, mm. potentially a harder occupation, depending who you talk to. <laughs> but straight out of high school and into the Navy, but you did actually think about being a Royal New Zealand Navy helicopter pilot. Is that right? Yes. So, well, that's ultimately what I wanted to do when I joined um, the Navy. I had a um, my brother-in-law at the time had a brother that was in the Navy and he just suggested it one day, oh, have you ever thought about joining the Navy when I was sixth form, I think. And um, I, for whatever reason, it appealed. It was out, I was sporty and the idea of going to sea and having adventures was quite exciting. And I think either the military appeals to you from that point of view. I hadn't, to be perfectly con honest, as a New Zealander, considered the war aspect of, <laughs> of the military. I just considered the fun aspect mm. with lots of mates going overseas. So I um, went along to, well, again, my mum, who I said who was very good at encouraging anything we showed interest in, took me along to um, the recruiters and they explained to me what the different jobs were, did a number of academic and personality tests on me and sort of said, oh, I think you'd be good at doing this job. And at that time, he said, oh, there are helicopter pilots. And I went, oh, a helicopter pilot would be really cool. But in order to become a helicopter pilot, you had to be fully qualified in the job that I ended up doing within the Navy. But oh, look, I'll be honest with you, it was a little bit of dumb luck that I got into that job, or or not. I Maybe I had a great recruiter, um, but he, he put me in a role that was probably as close as you can come to being a pilot, but on a ship. Yeah. And one of your deployments was up to, I think this is the late 1990s, was to Bougainville. Yes. What happened up there? Oh, 
at the time there was some civil unrest in um, the region. I um, am showing my ignorance here to be able to give you the history on Bougainville itself, but um, it had been mined for a number of years. and um, We're talking the, about mining for minerals. Yeah, know? mining yeah. for minerals, yeah. sorry. it was. It, I think it was one of per capita the richest countries in the world. I, look, I'm making that up a little bit. Someone could probably challenge me on that. But um, it was very rich in the minerals that it had. I think copper and something else. But um, again, I'm showing my ignorance and not remembering what the minerals were that they mined. But essentially there came a point where the local um, people were seeing the detrimental effects of that mining and were not realising any of the financial or positive effects of that mining. So they were getting very little money. Um, Whilst there were more jobs, they could see that their individual lifestyles were not improving and their land was... um, disappearing before their eyes. So there was a big uprising at at, um, some point in the history and we came in quite a bit of Quite a bit after that where there was a little bit more civil unrest and Papua New Guinea was involved um, in that they were claiming Bougainville um, as well. So they had troops on the ground um, and we went in there with Australian... um, military to as peacekeepers to try and reinvigorate the towns to be able to be a bit more successful for the people. And you were on the Navy diving vessel, the Manawanui? Yes. What yes. kind of work were you guys carrying out? So Manawanui was a specialist diving tender and um, we were there to try and extract a ship out of one of the harbours, Loloho was um, where we were based. and That had been sunk by the locals, is that right? Yeah, oh. I understand. So all the ports, this is my understanding of how it worked, is during the unrest, all the ports to stop mining being able to, or the minerals being able to be extracted from the ports, had ships that were sunk in those ports. So they were no longer able to be used. Um, so we went in there to try and float one of the ships that was sunk at this particular port. Um, And we were there for about three months. But my first deployment there was actually with Canterbury and we went over there and helped set up and things like that. But yeah, that was an amazing experience because um, working with the Australian military, we have a very different philosophy to them. Um, And we worked with them within a compound and getting to know the locals and yeah. Was... Did you manage to refloat that ship? No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not when I was there. To be perfectly honest, they may have later. Mm. Um, we initially had tried to refloat it, and then we tried to dredge um, to haul it out, um, but we didn't actually manage to get it out during my deployment there. But essentially, they may have come in with a different plan later, in which they were um, to cut that ship up. But yeah, working with the um, divers was a really interesting experience as well because an incredibly professional group of individuals with a very specialised set of skills. So um. so you do a stint in the Navy, I think it's about seven years. Yeah. You leave as a lieutenant. Yes. And you, you do a bit of time working for Coca-Cola. Yes. But you're still thinking and dreaming about becoming a pilot. So take us to that part of yes. your journey, of your story. How, how does that start where you actually decide, right, I want to do this? So when I left the military, you join, typically kids join the military straight out of school. So you're very ignorant as to what the wider world looks like. I grew up on a farm, so I knew basically a farm and I knew the military and very little outside of that. And um, the Navy's incredibly time consuming on your lifestyle. So I think the ship was supposed to go to sea 10 and a half months of the year that I left, chose to leave. So I wanted to go out and just see what else was out there. So I joined um, Coca-Cola Amateur at the time as an inwards goods manager, which was just a middle manager within the operations um, department. And Coca-Cola, as you'd know, is an enormous company with 
every opportunity of job, although I don't, I'm not sure they had journalists, but they did have communications experts and they had accountants and salespeople and management and all sorts of different areas. And after two years there, I realised that there was no job in the normal outside world that I could see that I wanted to pursue or that I would could imagine doing in five years' time. And that was the real turning point for me to go, OK, I'm going to commit to flying. Funnily enough, the day I left the Navy, my mum sent me a brochure for um, learning to fly at Massey University. Oh. And um, it took me two and a half years to sort of actually pursue that. Yeah. And and that's the organisation that I chose to um, learn to fly. But again, from a point of ignorance, I only knew that you could learn to fly in the military. And I knew nothing about learning to fly outside the military. So I just assumed that learning to fly at a um, university would be the most common way of that made sense to me. But to be honest, there, the, it was actually a very small, that learning to fly within a university scheme was actually kind of unusual for most pilots. So your first flight, mm-hmm. was that at Massey? Yes. And so you're in what, a, a, a Cessna or something like that? Yes, a Piper, but yeah, a small two-seater aircraft, yeah. And so you go up for the first time Yeah. as either a pilot or co-pilot or a trainee, I'm yeah. assuming. Is there something then where you feel, yeah, you know, is there something about flight and flying and being above the world or something which actually grabbed you? Did, I mean, I know you've, you've, mm-hmm. you've thought about it, but when you're actually doing it. Yeah, I remember being really excited watching, this sounds really dumb, but I'm really excited watching some of the students taxi the aircraft, like just being in it, driving it around on the ground. I even thought that was really cool. Yeah. But I recognised in my own personality the job I did in the Navy was to act, to drive ships. So I did the navigation and the driving of the ships and whole ships organisation, and you act as a, cap, a representative for the captain in that role. And it's a very specialised role that very few people do within the military. So on board with 250 people, there's three qualified people that, you do that role. Mm. And I recognised in leaving the Navy that I really missed being a specialist in something or knowing how to do something that, A, nobody else knew how to do, but required a really specific set of skills. And when I committed to learning to fly, the ocean, to be honest, is still really exciting to me. And if I could have done that job the same way I can fly, I would say that they're similar, really similar jobs, equally exciting. But flying has that adrenaline of being higher and faster. And, and the difference when you're flying an aircraft is you are physically handling it like you do a car. Whereas when you drive a ship you tell somebody to turn on to a heading. You're not actually Mm. driving it like you would an outdoor motor, for example. So when I got back into flying, it felt like driving a ship and it felt a little bit like home. And yeah, I was pretty excited by it. But to be honest, while I was training at Massey University, I felt incompetent for another word because you're learning something you don't know how to do. Yeah, And um, it wasn't until... A couple of years later, when I I really felt confident about my ability that I really, really loved flying. I would have said I enjoyed it, and then later on I was like, no, this is an absolute passion. And I guess anyone learning to drive anything is going to have a few mishaps, and I understand you yeah. crashed through a friend's once. <laughs> <laughs> Tama, that was between me and you. Um, <laughs> yes, when I was, I was instructing at um, North Shore Aero Club, where I... I would say every pilot has a um, a story about a near miss or, or something that's happened. And in this particular case, we were coming into land and um, we lost, we had a big downdraft, lost a lot of lift. And essentially the aircraft became like an elevator and we landed about uh, 20 metres short of the runway, which on 
little strips puts you on the other side usually puts you in a paddock so we went through a we landed and I'd already gone full power at that stage and we took off again and went just clipped the bottom of the fence as we came through but flew the aircraft round the circuit back round to land and um, the poor owner had a, a lot of damage to the aircraft the wing had a bit of a hole in it but um Aircraft are surprisingly resilient, <laughs> and the engine was fine, and it flew. It flew really well, even despite the damage. Um, and it was a it was a big learning curve. But um, so that's that's a learning. But it wasn't a a, a form of discouragement for you. It's just no. You it I think um, I think with anything, I suppose if you're learning to drive or anything, um, the time at which it was happened, I was comfortable with why it occurred, mm. and I didn't feel like it was incompetence on my part, um, and I was doing a lot of flying at the time, so I felt like uh, whilst I would have been very happy for it to not to have occurred, I didn't feel discouraged at the time. I put it, chalked it down to experience and learn from it. And the, look, there's all sorts of little milestones along the way um, with any career where you you think, oh, I'll try and remember that in the future. <laughs> and so you, but your first uh, time flying as a commercial pilot, mm-hmm. passengers on board, you're flying for, I think, was it Eagle Airways? Yes, and so they did some of the domestic routes around yeah. smaller to smaller centres around New Zealand. Yes. So essentially commercial flying is considered anything that you earn money. So those two-seater aircraft that you instruct on, you have to have a commercial licence because I'm being paid by the Aero Club in, in order to teach people. But as far as an airline goes, the first job was with um, Eagle Airways. Now, most people in New Zealand would remember them as the pencil planes. So we had the largest network with a near New Zealand. We'd fly to everywhere from Kaitaia through to Invercargill. Um, we used to fly into Wanaka, all the small little strips. So I think the commercial idea at the time was that we'd have so I was based in Fakatani for most of that period, and we used to have four flights a day in and out of Fakatani up to Auckland. So we had all these tiny little towns that we'd operate to regularly, and because those towns aren't large, we didn't need a big aircraft. And so 19 seats. I'm going into a bit too much detail, but 19 seats happens to be the regulatory number of seats where you don't need a flight attendant, Mm. 20 seats you need a flight attendant. Of course, costs and everything goes up once you start adding an extra person. So as a pilot of those particular aircraft, you also were the flight attendant. So you'd come on board and you'd check everyone's seat belts and you'd talk to them face to face if you've ever flown on one of those. I do remember that. Yeah, yeah. But the funny thing was, because you were all the females that flew at the time all had funny stories about passengers who would would get complaints through to management that would say, oh, our flight attendant hopped in the front next to the pilot and annoy, annoy, like annoyed them all the way to Auckland or something like <laughs> that, not realising that you actually were the pilot. Um, but yeah, no, that was an incredible... I don't think there'd be anybody that would look back and think, oh, I wish I did my career differently. But um, Eagle Airways had an aircraft that had no autopilot, so we hand flew those aircraft mm-hmm. everywhere. And um, it just gives you a very good set of skills when it comes to actually manipulating an aircraft. Just a lot of experience doing that. And, of course, New Zealand gets a lot of rough weather. Uh, yeah, know. we do. And so yeah. handling that, that manual handling all the way, Mm. How much of a challenge was that? It's not a challenge in the cruise. Generally speaking, once you get to the top of climb, you will most of the time be clear of weather. So that aircraft could get up to 25,000 feet. So um, we would usually operate between twenty and 25,000, just depending how long the leg was. Um, and so we would be above most weather. And that's it was an incredibly stable aircraft, easy to fly. The hard 
parts for any pilot is closer to the ground um, because you are trying to navigate along a, a 3D path, essentially, something that tells you um, laterally where to fly to make sure that you're safe of any terrain left and right and vertically where to fly so that you descend or climb at a particular rate um, to remain clear of that terrain as well. And that can get pretty challenging when there's big crosswinds at night um, into some aerodromes that typically had position near the ocean, so they get very strong crosswinds in in certain circumstances, and and that was more challenging than anything. No, I think a few people listening to this, myself included, will remember some very hairy landings in Wellington. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Um, Well, most people are scared of Wellington because of the turbulence you get on the approach. Often, actually landing in Wellington, it's not one of the more... Look, it it can be a difficult airport to land in, but for uh, the pencil planes, for example, it's huge. That runway's huge, and the the wind generally comes straight down the strip. So it's actually one of the easier runways to land in for a small aircraft. A jet aircraft, it's it's uh, shorter, but um, for a small aircraft, if you're flying any of the turboprops. It's not comfortable flying in because you get thrown around, but actually the landing is generally is generally not as challenging as some of the other airports for the pilots. Kia ora, and you're listening to Mapuna on RNZ National, and I'm talking to Fran Ebbett, who flies the Dreamliner nowadays, which is the Boeing 787. But we were just talking about your early career as a uh, commercial pilot, but you then become a pilot on passenger jets. How hard a nut was that to crack, to graduate from one to the other? Because those those smaller planes were propeller planes. These 787s, I've been looking at the specifications of them. These are big, big aircraft, very fast. How did that transition work for you? So aircraft, <laughs> a little bit like driving a car, Aircraft fly the same whether they're a two-seater or a 400-seater. Essentially, if you're landing a two-seater aircraft, you'll put the runway a third of the way up the windscreen, and you'll do the same thing on a big aircraft. So in terms of the mechanics of actually flying it, it's I think you could take most private pilots and at least talk them through being able to fly a really big aircraft. Obviously, it's a lot heavier. It has much more inertia. You start your turn. If you're doing a turn, it takes up a lot more real estate, so you need to start that a bit earlier. But that aspect of it is is familiar. The part that is less familiar is the systems involved in these these large aircraft as a pilot, it becomes more about managing a lot of different systems and understanding how those systems work rather than physically flying the aircraft. Um, the same as driving a go-kart versus driving a Tesla. There's there's different, um, a lot more um, sophistication involved with the, the big jets. Um, I actually went from... I. I happened just out of chance to be the first person to go straight on to um, the Airbus at Air New Zealand. Now, air, the Airbus air aircraft would be arguably one of the more sophisticated or complicated when it comes to what the aircraft does automatically does for you. And I went straight from the Beach 1900 or the pencil plane um, that we were just talking about, which is easily one of the most least sophisticated aircraft. It didn't even have an autopilot. So I went from the least sophisticated aircraft that Air New Zealand had to the most sophisticated aircraft that Air New Zealand had at the time. And um, I wasn't too sure how that would go. And I would say to start with, you paint by numbers. You learn to do what they tell you to do in order to make it work. But it's a good year before you start feeling really comfortable when you turn up to work and understand exactly how the aircraft works and another sort of two years before you start feeling like you've you've got a lot you've got enough experience to add but because you did 
domestic routes again on the jets, but I'd like to get to the international ones because as far as we're aware, it's mm-hmm. a qualified statement, you're the first Māori woman to captain an Air New Zealand passenger jet, as far as we we, we, we put that out there. Cause, but what, what I'm getting to is when it comes to passenger jets, are there many female pilots, full stop? There are a lot more now than there were. Um, look, we've got some pioneers well before me um, that have been captains on on Air New Zealand jets. Um, the percentage was very, very small. Um, I can't tell you exactly, but I'm pretty sure less than 1% prior to me starting on the jet fleet. I think now it would still be less than 5%, but... Again, um, that's anecdotal. Yeah. I'm guessing a little bit. Yeah, they're just approximate. Yeah, so we're not making, you know, <laughs> yeah. say so, absolute statements of yeah, fact. Yeah. But, but the yeah. percentages are quite low. And what I yeah. actually would like to get to now, because you said earlier that um, there's a bulletproof door between the cockpit and the rest of the cabin. Yes. Obviously, that we know why security is is now an issue. But what's going on in that cockpit? Because some of these flights are long. That one to New York is about, is it 19 hours? <laughs> Coming home, yes. Yeah. Do you, I mean, do you have fellas have your own cabin to sleep in? How, how does it work amongst you and the rest of the crew? Yeah, so depending on um, the length of the flight will depend on how many pilots there are. So the 787 with an our route structure flies to, well, everywhere internationally that Air New Zealand flies to. So um, if we were to fly to anything within through sort of four hours, we can do that to pilot. So legally, it, in accordance with the rules, we can fly up to eight hours. And, and so we can fly to Sydney and back, we can fly to Brisbane and back, we can fly to Tonga and back um, with two pilots, and and we regularly do that. Once you go a little bit further than that, then we need to have the means to be able to have a break. Um, So if you were to fly to Rarotonga, it's just a little bit too far to do it, two pilots, so we take an extra pilot. When you go to New York or Chicago, and this it comes down a little bit to how much time off you have at the other end, but um, we it's long enough that we need four pilots. So you always have two people flying the aircraft. Um, so someone in the left-hand seat is generally the person in command, and the person in the right-hand seat is the second in command or the first officer or co-pilot, most people. Are you called would. commander or captain? Captain. It's, it is captain. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And you got to the point of captain, was it pre-COVID? Yes. So on the Airbus, we are only a two-pilot fleet. So that aircraft does everything within about five miles, uh, sorry, five hours. So anything that we can fly two-pilot. And so I started as a first officer or co-pilot on that fleet. And then about 18 months before COVID, I trained to become a captain on that fleet and did that job up until um, the start of 2020. And then just as a side note, I had planned to take 2020 off to study and had a sabbatical for nine months and left about three weeks before COVID well, three weeks before our borders closed. So I felt pretty fortunate for that, to be honest, because aviation wasn't a great place to be in term- yeah. <laughs> over over COVID. You may have heard it wasn't particularly successful for airlines. Yeah, And we'll get back to that, but I just want to stick with the yeah. flying for just a little bit longer, because I, I looked up the specifications of the aircraft you fly. Yeah. Well, oh, I'll just go for the 787 at the moment, the Dreamliner. Yeah. And so it's got a top speed in excess of 900 kilometres an hour, cruising altitude around 35,000 feet, and it can weigh obviously more than 200 tonnes with up to around about 200, 240 passengers. When you're up in a command seat, either first officer or whatever, yeah. is, what's going through your mind with that that level of sophistication and power and weight and all those passengers on board? Does it feel like a responsibility? Does it something that um, it sort of... I don't know, heightens your senses or something? Or you, you've, you know, you've got all these people on board, you need to get them to that place, which is on the other side of the world. What, what is that like for you? 
I definitely think you feel the responsibility when you're a captain. And I would say that even of the pencil plane, if I had a full aircraft, I would feel a lot more responsibility than I would if we were just ferrying the aircraft from A to B. In terms of the level of sophistication, I guess we go into, on this particular aircraft, this is speaking to me personally, because we're quite remote from the passengers on the long-haul aircraft. Mm. I would say on the domestic aircraft, we see the passengers a lot more. You may have been on flights where the captains come out and made PAs in front of you. Usually that's when it's, you know, some sort of disrupt or trying to explain things so you've got someone to actually look at. But in the 787s are, are one of the two wild aircraft, a wide body aircraft. If we were to stand up the front and talk to people, we'd only be talking to business class. You know, no one down the back would see us. So yeah. we don't do that generally. And... Um, it it means that you feel quite remote from the passengers. So is that the, a good thing? It is in terms that it makes you quite consistent um, as a pilot as to how you operate. I must admit my personality misses that interaction with the passengers a bit, but but that's just personal. That's just completely a personality thing. What it does make you is focus on the sort of weight you have that day in terms of how you manipulate the aircraft or the considerations around some of the issues you might have that day. New York's a challenge because it, it's right on the limits of what the aircraft is capable of flying whilst having enough passengers. And why it's such a challenge is we're trying to get all the fuel on board and all the passengers. And often, in order to have enough fuel we might not be able to take all the passengers. And that's that's a juggle that the the companies had to deal with. Um, and any, any long-haul flight is like that, ultra-long-haul flight is what they call them. So anything that's over 14 hours, well, there's no aircraft in the world, oh, unless you're a private, it's a private aircraft, no commercial airline in the world that's configured to be able to take full fuel and full passengers. Yeah. Now... I have to ask a turbulence question because <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know so many people, and you would too, who when you fly, I, I guess there's something accentuated by being in a big jet 35,000 feet out over the Pacific Ocean. But um, I was did an Air New Zealand flight just last week to Hong mm-hmm. Kong and back, and there was some major turbulence. And yeah, I had a stranger grip my arm. Yeah. And But when I was doing a bit of research for this interview, I saw a YouTube video by a former commercial pilot who actually said, look, the way they test the aircraft you fly, the testing envelope, the stresses they'll put it under, are way in excess of most of what you experience Mm -hmm. on a commercial flight. What can you tell us about the handling of a plane in turbulence? So... You've probably (laughs) described it really well yourself. The amount of um, stresses they put their aircraft under is would exceed anything that we would ever come close to. Now, I don't even know if this is myth or not, but I've heard that they stress the 787 to the point where their wingtips could touch each other at the top of the fuselage. Now, there's no aerodynamic scenario in which that would occur, and it has that sort of flexibility. So um, what that means is when you hit turbulence and the aircraft um, is put under that strain, it is incredibly uncomfortable for people sitting in the aircraft, but the aircraft itself is unlikely to come anywhere near any any areas where we are concerned about the aerodynamic ability of the aircraft. I I have been flying for over 20 years and I can't honestly say that I've ever experienced severe turbulence. And severe turbulence is defined as uncontrollable, where us as pilots, we can't actually manipulate the aircraft to do what we want it to do because the environmental factors are so are so strong and I would say if you speak to any commercial pilot they are probably going to say something close to that maybe one or two times in their entire career where severe turbulence has occurred and it'll be far beyond what most people have experienced 
Now, during COVID, <clears throat> you said earlier you took time off to study and you learned Te Reo Māori. Aye. How was, how was that um, break for you? The break was amazing. Uh, look, there's, COVID was terrible for so many people. So this is just my personal experience. I'd already planned to have that that time off and there's little time in a in your career for most people where you actually get to have a break and time at home I had a my son was seven at the time so you know having time at home with him was fantastic but um, I went to Te Whareiwanang or Waikato um, so Waikato University to do their diploma um, in Te Reo Māori it's called Te Tohu Paitahi the experience of learning Māori, easily the most difficult thing I've ever done. Far more. <laughs> I've done, yeah, so we've spoken a bit about the history of um, of some of the things that I've experienced, but I would say learning my language was, was a real challenge. Just mentally, not physically, but mentally and emotionally, just by far the most difficult thing I've done. Yeah. But rewarding. Unbelievably yeah. award, rewarding. It was um, very eye-opening to realise. Oh, being Māori, I had always been very proud of being Māori and assumed that I am Māori. But um, I guess I could say I've been reasonably um, successful within the the Western world or, or within education and my I've, I've fitted quite naturally within that world and you without knowing it sort of your own self-esteem is attached to that ability to be able to do things naturally and when I started learning Māori I, I <laughs> was I was I felt very ignorant in the culture I felt very inadequate in the culture and the things that I was good at was of little or no value within that culture and the things that were of very high value within the culture I wasn't good at. So I felt I literally felt like every day the person that's going to get picked last when you played a game of soccer in the backyard when you were a kid. I just felt so I'm very, very humbled. But it opened up a world that was so exciting and um, I will never be a natural Māori language speaker, but it's something for the rest of my life I'll, I'd like to pursue. It's history, the the culture itself. Like, actually, two weeks ago, my uh, niece and I went to Tahiti and uh, Rangiatia or Raiatia um, to try and trace some of that history. It was an amazing experience, something that I just wouldn't have appreciated prior to um, this e- education in our language. Yeah. You mentioned the future. Do you see yourself continuing as a commercial pilot? Would you like to move into other areas of aviation, perhaps? I definitely see myself continuing as a commercial pilot um, within um, in New Zealand. If you want to live in New Zealand, it is kind of the, the pinnacle um, place to fly. Um, there are other options in terms of being um, commercial pilots in, in other places. I guess the idea is it's a very long career in aviation, so it's keeping yourself active within that industry. So um, training, looking at different aircraft types, doing things outside of that role that keep you interested in your day-to-day job as well, rather than thinking, oh, yay, I'm just going off to New York um, today and I get three days looking around the Big Apple. You know? yeah. like that's, that's an amazing perk to the job, but it's not the job, if that makes sense. Um, so my future, yes, I see it within the commercial airline. I'd like to give back a little bit at some stage. My son's 12. He... Um, that's a big priority for me at the moment, and when he leaves home, then there'll be there'll be different areas. But I, I I've recently been trying to encourage other Maori rangatahi to be interested in flying, and um, there's an amazing program called the Walsh Flying School that does a, a camp. It's run through Scouts, but it's for two weeks each year, and. Uh, a very close friend of mine, but he, a Māori boy who's very, very close with his um, his culture, um, went on that camp and found it amazing. And I'd like to encourage more Māori to get involved because 
From my experience, they're enormous asset to the industry. They have, by as a generalisation, Māori are very good with with sound and motion and and coordination, and and that's a very big part of aviation. Um, and then you just got to have that other side of you that thinks quite. Um, spatially and so being able to manipulate things in your head like that and being quite procedural. So there's a lot of things within um, our Māori rangatahi that I see being very, very advantageous and my utopian kind of idea is to get more and more Māori involved in, um, in that industry because it's an industry that provides um, an amazing career like it's a lifetime career, and most people, 99% of people who get involved in it do it out of passion and love. So it's quite rare that you get someone that doesn't actually like their job. They all love flying. Yeah. <laughs> At the core of it, they love flying. And I meet so many people that say, man, wouldn't it be great to love your job? And I'm like, oh, I do. I love my job. And and most pilots, I would say, say the same thing. We've all got our complaints, as anyone does, but um, at the heart of it, they love it. And so I'd love to see that within our community jobs that they really love, but also a job that provides very well financially. And I would say f- within my whanau and my wider whanau, we've benefited hugely from the ability to um, travel around Around, travel around the world and see different cultures. Generally speaking, you get a minimum of 10 days off in a four-week period. As a long-haul pilot, you'll typically get around 14 days off. So that's 50% of the time is time off at home. Whilst you're at work, you're engaged and you're professional. But we literally park the plane, and apart from a um, having to study for our competencies that we we get tested twice a year for two days, twice a year, plus we have training. Apart from the study for that, you're not taking your work home with you. You're not taking your cell phone. You're not getting emails and phone calls. And you've done your job. You've landed the aircraft. It's parked at the gate. And it's just incredibly rewarding to go home and be completely disengaged. Admittedly, at the moment, you can go home a bit fatigued because you've been flying overnight. But outside of that, you don't have you you can commit fully fully to your family and friends because you don't have these other stresses 